It's my pleasure um, to uh, introduce to you Elizabeth Kirkby, who's Australia's oldest university graduate, if you'll forgive me, at the age of 93. Dr Kirby, welcome to the Science Show studio. Would you please give me a summary of your thesis? Well, the thesis is based on the experience of the 1930s Depression because it still has relevance today, particularly in the wake of the global financial crisis. And I think that the crisis has revived the horrors of the Great Depression for some older people in Australia. However, a new generation of bankers and financiers appear to have no understanding at all of the impact of economic orthodoxy on the unemployed in the 1930s and what might be the effect on the unemployed today. In the 1930s, the unemployed were forced below the poverty line by administrations following the ideology that insisted that the repayment of debt had to take precedence over a need to create jobs. Also, the prosperity of the 1990s has allowed policymakers to ignore the social implications of austerity measures and important initiatives which were introduced in the 1930s. Many economists believed that the Great Depression could never happen again because the world had moved on. Paul Krugman cites Alan Greenspan, who was the chairman of the Federal Reserve in America in 2005, and stated increasingly complex financial instruments have contributed to the development of a far more flexible, efficient and hence resilient financial system than the one that existed a quarter of a century ago. However... GFC has proved Greenspan's optimistic assessment to be false. And in 2013, in an essay that was published by the Council on Foreign Relations Foreign Affairs, Greenspan admitted that he never saw it coming. Although Australia, of course, has been lucky to avoid the worst of the GFC, Britain, Europe and the United States are still trying to rebuild what were once robust economies and, of course, trying to control unemployment. Thank you. And that was an excellent summary of your thesis. And the fact that you are 93, having just been doctored, if you like, (laughs) is astonishingly enough. But the fact you read it with no glasses, how come... Oh, that came of having cataract operations. I didn't realise when I was told by the ophthalmologist it would be a good idea to have the cataracts done that it meant I could go without glasses. But, I mean, that has been the result. I had the cataracts done last year, just over 12 months ago, and now I can read that size print without glasses and when I'm being tested in the office and you read that chart I can read everything except the bottom two layers. Isn't that astounding? I find it amazing. I still need, I'm slightly younger than you are, Yes, (laughs) I need these glasses. What made you decide to do a PhD later in life? Well, after I retired from Parliament I bought a sheep and wheat property in the Riverina, in Tamora, outside Wagga Wagga. And I was very busy and everything was going well for the first two years and then we hit the 10-year drought, which wasn't very good for sheep and wheat, particularly for wheat. And I was also feeling that it would be a good idea, being an old lady, not to waste any more money on propping up property that wasn't at least covering its expenses. And at the same time, I decided that I would 
attempt a degree by distance education at Charleston University in Wagga Wagga. And I completed the degree and went on to do an honours year. And my thesis for the honours year was the impact of the Great Depression in Britain as demonstrated through the books and films and popular music of the era, which, of course, was my childhood, so I remembered the music. And when that was completed in 2009, of course, we were just hit by the global financial crisis. And I thought by that time I knew I was coming back to live in Sydney, would there be a master's in the impact of the Great Depression in Australia? And I went to see Professor Greg Patmore. And Greg was terrific. Initially, he just said, oh, keep writing, keep writing, send it to me. But in the middle of the first year, he suddenly read what I'd written so far and said, come on, this is going to be a PhD. And I was shattered. I mean, I never thought it was possible to sort of do such a quantum leap. However, he persuaded me and I started on the thesis. It's bad enough for students getting the confidence at any level, but for you in a different situation like that, did you ever feel, oh my gosh, this can't happen, uh, it's taking too long, or do I have what it takes, or you know, just being back in academe again? Yes, oh, definitely all of that. I mean, when I'd done the honours degree at Charles Sturt, for the first time since I was 17, I had to sit an end-of-year exam. And you go into the examination hall, you go and sit where your number is, and you wait, and then you are told, now you can start writing. And you start writing. And it was, for the first 10, 15 minutes, it was terrifying. But then, of course, I realised when I looked at the questions, well, of course you can answer that. And I went can. on scribbling and scribbling until my writing was almost illegible. So I thought, well, I managed that so I can manage another go at something. Well, if you can manage the stage and television and who knows... Parliament, especially in New South Wales, you can handle anything, surely. I don't know. I don't think that they were really training grounds for writing a thesis. Obviously, you've been asked by a number of people around about your age whether it's actually worth doing something like that. What do you say when you get that question? Well, I had been informed by scientists that in old age... If you didn't want to lose your marbles, either you use them or you lose it. So I was determined that I would attempt not to lose my marbles. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, I would put them under test. I think you've got more marbles than most, Kirby. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for coming in. Thank you. Thank you.